The future of work. We team up. We are open. We make conscious choices. We focus. We contribute. We refresh. We are Microsoft, the Netherlands. And these are our rituals anywhere, anytime. This is Microsoft Security Lifehack Podcast. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, yeah this brand new setup that we have. We're going to call it our podcast studio. En uh, mensen die nu uh, aanwezig zijn, ik zal toch even nee zeggen. Hartelijk welkom uh, bij deze ja, uitzending vanuit onze nieuwe podcast studio. Um, vandaag een superleuk onderwerp. We gaan het hebben over Log4J, uh, ons kerstcadeautje wat we al hebben gehad. Um, we doen het vandaag vanuit de studio. We hebben ook mensen remote. Het is superleuk. We gaan het allemaal proberen. Um, nog even een dingetje vooraf. Mocht je vragen hebben, stel ze vooral in de Q&A. Die houden we ondertussen ook bij. Uh, deze sessie zal vandaag in het Engels worden gedaan. Um, omdat uh, we natuurlijk uh, al onze specialisten, die, komen, ja, die moet je van ver halen. Want uh, ja, de, wat je van ver haalt is altijd goed natuurlijk. Um, vandaag hebben we dus uh, Schroetnie en we hebben Ronnie hebben we vandaag. So I will switch over to English and uh, then uh, uh, we can get started uh, with it. Um, I think let me first introduce the speaker. Shuri, can you please begin? Who are you and what are you doing? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the marvelous introduction, Jeroen. Um, this is Shruti. I am a technical specialist, technical security specialist within Microsoft. Uh, joined Microsoft about eight months ago, and uh, I am in charge of um, all the pre-sales activities, conducting webinars, educating our customers, uh, educating our partners, uh, also uh, doing these kind of webinars through which I uh, get a reach to the wider audience. And uh, when I say I'm a technical security specialist, I mean uh, I do a lot of demos. I remove any roadblocks that customers uh, encounter while implementing our solutions. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Other than that, we can talk separately on LinkedIn or uh, on other uh, platforms. You can find me. Uh, handing over to Ronnie. Thanks, uh, Shruti, and uh, thank you for having us, uh, Jeroen. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Ronnie de Jong. I'm working for Microsoft since uh, September last year, and I joined uh, Microsoft in the role as security technical specialist as well. And actually, I'm, I'm doing the same activities as should be mentioned, um, yeah, helping uh, customers, envisioning them. Um, I had some background in the past uh, from the partner landscape uh, with, with the work, modern workspace and now heading over to uh, the yeah, security space. So it's not limited to the workplace only, but it's a broader than uh, the workplace, so also covering. Uh, the infrastructure, the data center part, and um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, have you all here and talking about Log4A and how you can respond as an organization uh, to Log4A and not in particular Log4A, but also through the threats in general and how to keep up. Yeah, great for that. And uh, do we have an agenda uh, for today? Can we please uh, see what the agenda is? And um, who's going to talk me through the agenda? I'm wondering. Absolutely, uh, I can do that. So uh, in today's agenda, we have uh, basics of Log4j. So of course, basically now this is a vulnerability that has moved the cyber world and everybody pretty much knows about it, but we would still like to burst some myths around it. Uh, we will also talk about how you can respond to Log4j about your preparation, um, the tools and technologies that you can use uh, from Microsoft Stack, how we can help you, what is the world thinking about it, uh, how you can improve your cyber resilience, uh, even, even looking beyond Microsoft. Uh, lastly, we will also discuss uh, the summary or the key takeaways from the session, followed by any questions that you guys might have. Excellent, good to see. And let's start off with the first topic about Microsoft security. Um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jeroen. So uh, first of all, uh, what is Log4J? Uh, I, I think uh, most of us know about it or people who are attending this uh, webinar slash podcast, uh, they would know that this is a, a vulnerability which is found in most of the uh, uh, applications, web services and so on. Uh, this was uh, discovered sometime in late in November, early December uh, in 2021. Uh, now, what is it exactly? So it is basically a freely available open source tool from Apache that is used by a lot of developers and uh, coders to basically log activities in an application. It can be installed separately, 
but uh, more often it is already included in the source code of uh, another software package. Um, it's worthwhile to note that uh, there are many vulnerabilities. So uh, starting with the first myth, people think that the only vulnerability associated with log4j is 44228, but that is not the case. There are many other vulnerabilities which we will talk about. Are there like any other things, so not only uh, uh, all the Apache stuff, but is there also other stuff that might be impacted on this uh, and what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Um, so there are uh, a lot of Apache projects that are impacted by log4j vulnerabilities. Apache has uh, published a list of such projects. If you Bing it, uh, typing Apache projects affected by log4j, uh, then there is a full blog post that comes up that gives you a list of such uh, projects. Now it is very important to note that it's not if 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 you're not working with Apache or if you're not logging anything, uh, it's not necessary that you are escaping log4j because log4j is affecting any application, any web service, anything basically in and out that does any kind of logging plus is using Java. There are two versions of log4j, log4j1 and log4j2. Now what we are going to talk about and what the world is affected by is only uh, log4j2 that has such vulnerabilities. Reason being that log4j version 1, it does not have lookups. Uh, log4j version 2 on the other hand, it does a lot of dynamic lookups, which is why it is uh, the most impacted. Um, now I'm going to talk a little technical here. Um, what exactly is log4j? Like we've heard a lot about it. We know it affects Apache, Java, logging and so on. Those are the, the buzzwords floating around. But it is basically, uh, think about it, think about an attacker who has a class, uh, a Java class, uh, a, a class basically hosted on uh, the server owned by an attacker. Now, this class is being pulled in by an application that is running on the victim's computer. Right now. Looking at the setup, looking at an object within the class in context of this application, uh, followed by a function inside that object being executed. This is a typical definition of remote code execution, and this is exactly the vulnerability that we're talking about. So a remote code vulnerability in Apache log4j version 2 is called your log4j vulnerability or also known as log4j shell. Now I also mentioned that it's not just one vulnerability 44228. There are multiple vulnerabilities that you can see on the screen. Um, uh, the, the top vulnerability was found recently in version log4j 1. Um, it is recent, that is why it's on the top in our uh, list, because also because it has a current score of 10. The ones that you see in bold, those are the ones that we will also talk about in detail. So uh, 44228, it is uh, basically affecting uh, version uh, 2 to 2.0 to 2.14.1. 2 um, it is fixed in the next version, which is 2.15. Then there is another vulnerability that right now has a score of 5.1 CVE 2021-45046. Uh, this is basically uh, a vulnerability related to information leak, remote code execution. Again, it affects version 2 to version 2.15 with an exception of 2.12.2 uh, where it is fixed. Uh, there are also other vulnerabilities which we will talk about, uh, but without getting too much into numbers and details, uh, I will just point you to the last one, which is uh, 45105. It is basically a DOS vulnerability affecting versions 2 to 2.16. It is fixed in 2.17. Well, those are a lot of numbers. I, I've never heard so many numbers going back and forth, back and forth. So. Uh, if it's like dazzling, like it is for me sometimes, it's good to look at this slide and you can uh, see the information. And also good to know that we will share these slides uh, with you um, at the end of the session. You will get a thank you mail for attending and we will share everything also with you. Just I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, Log4j, if you have like your own coded applications, is it also then being affected with this if you're using these kind of mechanisms uh, like Log4j? 
Absolutely. So all of these applications that are uh, coded, they are coded somewhere. So even if you're doing it manually sitting at your home, if you're using Java, if you're using Apache, if you're using those versions in which these vulnerabilities are, you are affected provided you're using it for logging. That makes me also say that uh, the, it was widespread in the news that Apple, Twitter, Cloud, uh, Cloudflare, uh, CrowdStrike, all of those guys were affected uh, because they are using those versions. They are doing some sort of logging. Logging is not bad. Logging is also good. It it keeps you, uh, it lets you keep an audit trail. It helps you trace back uh, incidents and events in time. So logging is not bad, but uh, logging using these versions could affect you, could harm you. Thank you for that answer. It's uh, excellent. So let's continue. Sure, uh, let's move on and also discuss the timeline of events that happened here. So basically in, in short, what happened when? Um, so the first ever report was uh, not a report or the first ever finding an uh, unofficial report was published by uh, Chen Zhaojun. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but that's it. So that person from Alibaba security, cloud security reported this vulnerability on 24th of November, followed by um, uh, our favorite number of, of CVE, which is very easy to remember, also 44228 that was published. Uh, it was, when it was published, it had a CVSS score of 10, which means it was a very high critical vulnerability. On December 1, uh, and also I should say in the first week of December, there were a lot of attack sightings that happened, uh, which makes me help you burst yet another myth. A lot of news articles are calling Log4j as a zero day vulnerability, but it was not zero day because um, it was uh, reported much before uh, uh, the CVE was published. So it, 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 it wasn't like, it, it wasn't unknown when the attacks happened. Um, then uh, on 6th of December, uh, Log4j version 2.15 was released as a patch for that critical vulnerability. We also saw some that patch being exploited around 9th and 10th of December, uh, which made the world and Apache release yet another uh, version, Log4j 2.16. Now, um, you will see on this timeline slide that on 13th December, Log4j 2.16 patch was released. And after that, we are talking about a CVE that was created. But worthwhile to note that even though the CVE was created on 14th December, we already had a patch for it. So Log4j 2.16 and 2.12, they together mitigate the CVE that was uh, published on 14th December 45046. Um, around 15th December, there was a ransomware attack on Minecraft. Of course, mine, Minecraft is also logging things, uh, followed by yet another CVE on uh, in the duration of 16th to 18th December. Actually, it was published on 18th December, but there, there were already vulnerabilities cited around 16th of December. Uh, then uh, another patch was released on 18th December, a Log4j 2.17. Uh, this was uh, also exploited later on. Uh, we are we are still using. Uh, if, if you're using Log4j 2.17.0, it's better to switch to 2.17.12 and so on. Um, it does not end there. Since January, uh, there have been three more CVEs published, but thankfully those CVEs are not on Log4j version two, they are on Log4j version one. So if you're using version one uh, still, please upgrade. Yeah. Yeah, thanks uh, Shruti for, for the timeline. And uh, indeed there are so many numbers and so many CVEs, uh, but let's have a look um how the log for j kill chain uh, look like and with this simple animation uh, we 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 want to uh, show you the remote code execution exploit uh, we be talking about the uh, 44228 and uh, as you all already briefly explained uh, the log for j exploit attempt uh, comes with a lookup and um, Many websites are using the component and actually when an HTTP uh, web request uh, includes an, a malicious uh, lookup uh, that can be an agent string or it can be an LDAP or can be uh, various other uh, strings. It's, uh, it's locked, it's, it's processed 
and uh, the, the vulnerable log4j library logs the request without validating. And so it is uh, logging it without sanitizing the URL uh, with a malicious string. So it's it's moving forward then, and it's propagating and in the uh, in the URL and the request there is um, uh, actually a remote uh, request from an attacker controlled server. So by doing that, um, the log for ye is looking up and reaching out to the, uh, the server which contains uh, the malicious code for payload. Um, and you can see that from there, it's downloading the payload, the malicious payload to the log for ye uh, server. And once the malicious payload is uh, requested and downloaded um, from the attacker control server, as you can see, uh, the, the payload is then actually executed on the vulnerable log 4 uh, library or where the library is uh, running on. And from there, um, the payload can contain uh, what, whatsoever uh, the attacker has developed. So that can lead to remote code execution to the rest of your organization. And it's moving on to, to the rest of the organization and it can do harm. It can do uh, exfiltrate information, um, moving out your organization without being aware of it. So this, this makes clear make how, uh, how vulnerable this threat is and what potential impact can have. Just a question that we have also from the audience, uh, um, uh, uh, Ronnie, and also yes. Sufi. Um, why upgrade if you are using uh, version one? My understanding was that version one was not vulnerable. That's a question we get from the audience. Yeah. Actually, version one is uh, vulnerable to a lot of other vulnerabilities. So um, what I showed on the timeline slide, uh, there were there are three CVEs published in January 2022, which affect version one. And also uh, from the older times before log4j version 2 was released, uh, log4j version 1 already was uh, exploitable, vulnerable to a lot of other vulnerabilities. So no, it is not secure. Plus, um, it depends on your requirement. If you want dynamic lookups, you should use log4j version 2. If not, one is fine. But uh, keep in mind the vulnerabilities that you will be dealing with if you, uh, if you are using version 1. Um, I would strongly recommend using uh, the latest version 2.17.1 or, or even latest. Okay, thank you for that uh, uh, answer and uh, hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, please uh, reply to us and for others. If you have any questions, please let us know. And now back to Ronnie. Yes, yeah, so, so as we now know that it's important to keep up uh, with, with the latest versions. Um, and we have now an understanding of all log for yay and what it can potentially uh, harm. And we have multiple uh, exploits, uh, but how, how to respond to log4j, um, but in general, how to respond to, to threats? And um, where do you start uh, as an organization? And it all starts with visibility. And uh, as you mentioned, there are multiple uh, log4j versions. Um, depending on your, your application landscape, you might have various a state of uh, log 4 a and log 4 a versions. And sometimes uh, it's unknown because log 4 a comes with a product which you are implemented in your organization. So you're not always aware of uh, the component of log 4 a Before this whole log 4 a uh, exploit, I wasn't aware either. So it all starts with uh, your inventory. So keep track on your assets and your software inventory. And um, so you make sure and you have a clear understanding where log 4 a is being uh, positioned in your organization. And based on that, you can also determine what versions you are using. And based on that, uh, you can take actions like uh, updating your components. So uh, make sure that you have your update processes in place and make sure that you're patching all your log 4 a um, um, instances to the latest version. Another approach to mitigate is um, adjusting the configuration of log 4 And um, with log 4 2 we, we have to look up capability, which, which is uh, useful, um, but you can configure that so you are disabling the lookup, for example. Uh, but that can be a hassle, uh, particularly where you have a large environment with a lot of 
love VA instances. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the best approach, but it can be an approach. And lastly, of course, you can disable the, 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 look, the lookup capability of the log VA. So there are a few things you, you can do to, to mitigate, but um, yeah, this is an example of, of uh, one vulnerability, but as you, uh, as you saw in the uh, timeline, multiple uh, versions that goes around and yeah, you have the steady process to easily update your, your instances, for example. And um, of course, we have tools like scanners, for example, and uh, these scanners help you to identify uh, your log VA instances, but it's, it's a kind of an ad hoc approach. So it's a hit and run, and um, you're not sure if you are covering all your assets which you have in your, uh, in your landscape. And that's why it's important to, to get and gain visibility. And one of the things which helps you to gain this visibility is uh, threat and vulnerability management. And um, it's, it's actually helping you identifying uh, potential vulnerabilities. And based on that, you can take actions and you can effectively uh, target your updates and make sure that you're uh, running the latest versions in your environment. So that's that's one of the most yeah, uh, important and, and strong capabilities with threat and vulnerability management, including unmanaged devices, for example. And uh, this is also ensuring you uh, the exposure of the, of the vulnerabilities and even uh, as mentioned, which assets are impacted or are misconfigured or which ones are already updated. So that gives you a clear overview and a clear picture of how vulnerable you are for this threat. And that's, that's bringing you in a more kind of a control. If you know where the threat is, you can precisely take action on it instead of staying in the dark. So that gives you a more programmatic approach. And this is not only limited for log 4 a it's, it's going beyond. It's for every uh, zero day or threats which are identified or are known, um, you can use threat and vulnerability management to make sure, okay, where are we standing as an organization to a certain threat? That's why it's not only focusing on log 4 a but it's also a, a future-proof approach. Um, and if you go uh, much more further, it's not only starting with the detection of if uh, vulnerable components are in your organization, it's also an exploit of those vulnerabilities. So if, if you missed uh, these, uh, you don't have them on, on the radar, they might be misused or the exploits might be uh, in your organization. And that's a, a second approach, which is a kind of an in-depth approach of uh, securing your organization is detecting uh, if the vulnerability is exploited. So here you can see uh, with the help of Defender for Endpoint, you see, for example, uh, is that uh, a lookup has been processed um, and the agent string which we, we explained, including the GNDI uh, lookup, for example. Uh, and based on that, you can just determine whether your uh, uh, surfacing this exploit and so it's not only detecting if uh, a vulnerable uh, version is installed but it's also uh, detecting the exploit in execution or the post exploitation activity so this gives you a more enhanced and sophisticated uh, way to uh, yeah, monitor your organization okay um, so that actually brings us to the uh, to yet another technology by Microsoft, which I also see is a question in uh, in the chat. Does this also identify log4j usage in containers? So what uh, what my friend Ronnie uh, just spoke about that was related to your uh, endpoints, uh, primarily on premise. Now, um, what you see on this page is uh, Defender for Cloud. Uh, this basically uh, looks at your cloud security posture management, your vulnerability assessments, in inventory management, uh, and workload protection all in the cloud. So if you talk about containers, Kubernetes, uh, your IoT, OT devices, uh, your SQL servers, your virtual machines, etc., in the cloud, 
then um, all of that uh, is scanned, remediated, um, fixed uh, uh, through through this uh, technology. So what you see here, uh, if if we can zoom in, Ronnie, a little. Uh, on the screenshot towards the right, then we see that uh, Defender for Cloud, it basically natively integrates with uh, any vulnerability assessment tools that you might already have. So for example, if you have your own scanners, um, I will not talk about the brands here, but if you have your own scanners, then it natively integrates. Um, it also natively integrates with Microsoft uh, vulnerability assessment tools, uh, also MDE, which is Defender for Endpoint and Defender for Servers. Uh, note, however, Defender for Endpoint is not just a vulnerability management solution. It goes much more beyond that. Vulnerability management is probably one sixth of what a Defender for Endpoint can do for you. Uh, you can see on the screen, uh, uh, the one that we just highlighted was a uh, log4j uh, related detection. So uh, you can not only detect uh, during or before exploitation, you can also see uh, post exploitation activities in there. That brings me to the next subject, um, Sentinel. So you know that you can cover a lot of depth, do hunting, investigation, get alerted, through our M365 Defender Suite or also our Defender for Cloud uh, technology. Now, while these solutions offer you uh, depth, uh, Sentinel, which is our seam source solution that offers you a lot of breadth. And when I talk about breadth, uh, Sentinel has Content Hub, which includes uh, workbooks, uh, playbooks, analytical rules, queries, uh, hun advanced hunting queries, and so on. Uh, with, I will not go deep into it because if I do, then I will probably be talking for hours. Uh, but there is a new analytics rule in Microsoft Sentinel that monitors against the known indicators of compromise uh, for log4j. So if we zoom on the screen, we can directly see uh, that there was something caught by Sentinel uh, on which uh, yeah, so sorry, this does not show alert. This only shows the analytical rule. So if you see uh, the uh, user agent search for log4j exploitation attempt, so that's a rule uh, that is uh, already uh, in our uh, default analytics rules uh, built in within Sentinel. If you have more uh, information on IOCs, you can always add to your rule set, but this is something that Microsoft already provides uh, as part of Sentinel uh, 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 rule sets. Of course, there are different types of rules. Uh, this one was only a scheduled rule. We also have fusion rules which bring in their own machine learning and, and compute models. And to, to add on, if you are already using Sentinel, for example, uh, there is a, a community uh, a contribution. It's uh, part of the, the Sentinel Content Hub, uh, which you can download um, uh, um, an, an already prepared uh, solution which includes all the workbooks, the analytics rules, so you can um, apply them directly. So to take benefit of it and get also the insights whether or not um, you're uh, you're exploited for a log VA. Uh, so that's a great on and definitely worth to reach out. It's free and you can just um, in, in, yeah implement it with a few clicks. So that's definitely uh, something we would uh, recommend to you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, Going to the next one, uh, briefly talking about Azure uh, Web Application Firewall, uh, WAF, which already now has added to its default rule, uh, uh, rule set, uh, a rule against log4j, uh, including Azure Front Door and Azure uh, Application Gateway. Uh, we also have firewall uh, logs now, um, which basically make it possible to uh, find out any exploitation attempts against uh, CVE uh, 44228 identified in 2021. Uh, to respect the CVE community, I should probably take the full name CVE 2021 44228. Um, you, you can also zoom in uh, to see those uh, rule sets. Uh, also, I see there is a question in the chat uh, about identifying which components might be vulnerable. Uh, while we will cover that in a minute, uh, 
let me quickly tell you that there are uh, uh, Apache projects. Uh, uh, Apache has published an entire list of projects uh, which are vulnerable. There, there is, there are also publications uh, by the Dutch Cybersecurity Center, which we will talk about towards the end. Uh, you can go to those uh, lists and check whether your uh, services, applications, etc., are vulnerable. However, whether certain components within those services are available or not in order to identify that. Plus, there could be some services that you're using which are not a part of those list uh, from the Dutch Cybersecurity Center or Apache. So do not 100% rely on those lists. Uh, keep in mind that there could be other components or other services that you're using which are vulnerable. So do a self check uh, to see whether uh, your components or services or applications or anything is logging, is doing logging, any sort of logging using uh, Java or uh, uh, on on or, or using log4j version two. So check that out. Check your uh, check your uh, latest log4j version using which you're doing the logging. If you're not doing logging and if you're not using those versions, then you're in the clear. Yeah, we got a question here also in the chat again. So uh, let's uh, bring it uh, to the both of you. Um, we got a question stating, and if my organization already invests in MDE and Defender for Cloud, uh, what would be the strong argument to use Sentinel, uh, given we can already perform quite a lot of hunting and uh, threat detection uh, in other tools and also shown in the example? So what's the extra benefit of using Sentinel? Great question. So first of all, thank you for saying that using MDE and Defender for Cloud, you have a very, very strong coverage. Uh, I hope everybody is listening to that. <laughs> uh, however, uh, note that they give you a lot of depth, like I said. So you can investigate, hunt, and uh, do all of that in those individual solutions. Keep in mind that Defender for Endpoint uh, provides, the scope of Defender for Endpoint is your on-premise uh, endpoints and scope for Defender for Cloud is your cloud workloads. If you want a single pane of glass on top of this, then that's Sentinel because Sentinel uh, gets signals and telemetry not just from MDE and Defender for Cloud, but also from Defender for Office, also from Defender for Identity, also from uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, which was previously called MCAS, uh, our Cloud Access Security Broker. Um, other than these, other than the technology stack, there are sensors built deep within the Windows operating system. We also get a lot of threat intel from Xbox, which um, some say is the uh, highest attacked uh, surface. Uh, attacked surface, I wouldn't say exploited surface because we do have measures against that. So from Xbox, Bing, um, other threat intel and all the other sources, if you want a single pane of glass, then that's Sentinel. It is not limited to uh, getting signals only from MDE and Defender for Cloud. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's, it's it actually it gives you the complete uh, overview of the, the, the complete uh, attack storyline. Eh? Uh, with MDE and Defender for Cloud, you have part of the stories and storyline and uh, when you uh, rolling them up all those signals into Sentinel, uh, including the fusion uh, capabilities, then you will get the entire or the complete picture. And then you can, yeah, let's say reading the threat and you can uh, follow it where uh, um, the, the zero day uh, is coming into your organization and how to, to respond to it. So that that's, yeah, uh, the, the value read of a uh, seam solution on top of uh, uh, Defender uh, solutions you're already uh, using. Also, Sentinel is not just SIEM, it's also SOAR, uh, your security uh, orchestrated uh, uh, automated response, response capabilities also, also come with Sentinel. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on uh, and talk about how you can improve your cyber resilience, not just against Log4j, but also against any similar vulnerabilities that crop up uh, in the cyber world. Over to Ronnie. Well, thanks, Shruti. Um, yeah, we, we talked about uh, several uh, uh, solutions, uh, but when it comes to improve your cyber resilience, it's actually, it, it comes with a plan, it comes with a kind of a strategy. And based on that, you can um, uh, take actions and make it an uh, actionable approach. So, uh, for example, the, the NIST cybersecurity 
framework uh, is a good example of a uh, framework which is based on existing standards, guidelines and best practices to yeah, manage and help your cybersecurity uh, uh, for your organization. And as you can see, the, the framework uh, is uh, divided in five parts. So it's identify, it's protecting and protecting the uh, what, what do I need? Need to safeguard. Uh, what do I need to protect? Well, uh, it's that those are my assets. So in the part of the identity and the, the identify part, you can identify your assets. Yeah, um, you need to protect those assets. And the next thing is techniques you can uh, to identify these incidents yeah, by detecting. And lastly, uh, responding to those incidents. Uh, uh, and what techniques you can use um, to determine the impact and mitigate those incidents. So how do you respond to those incidents? Uh, like uh, Shruti mentioned, what tools are you using? Therefore, is it a manual approach? Um, are you using automation? And uh, do you have uh, point solutions or do you have a holistic approach to respond to your threats in your organization? So let's Let's move on and focus on three of those five pillars, uh, like protect, detect, and respond. And if we are uh, comparing uh, these to the, the Microsoft stack, eh, it all starts with identifying your assets. And with assets, we are talking about identities, can be devices, um, applications, data, but also your infrastructure, your infrastructure components. And um, if you're going uh, to, to protect those assets, um, uh, you have several uh, services from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft 365 uh, security stack, and it starts with, with the foundation, uh, which comes with the E3. And that levers uh, the foundation to protect your identities, your devices, your applications, and your data. Yeah, so that's the first line of defense. So these are actually the basics. Make sure you're using strong authentication. Your identities are protected with, for example, multi-factor authentication, or you're using passwordless. Um, your endpoints are protected with uh, Defender for Endpoint. Uh, of, uh, yeah, and you're managing that with, with Endpoint Manager. Um, your email, yeah, you're protecting with Exchange Online or other uh, measurements, and you're protecting your data. And when it comes to cloud, you can use Defender for Cloud for uh, cloud security posture management. And you can also use that for protecting your workloads, which are hosted in the cloud. So this is the foundation. So we do have um, identified our assets. We are protecting them. And the final stage is actually um, uh, the detect and respond capabilities. So these are the next steps to um, yeah, uh, make your organization more resilient for threats. So with detect and respond, we are actually introducing um, extended detection and response capabilities. So we are again, we are de protecting our identities, uh, whether our, the identities are hosted on premise or even in the cloud with a hybrid scenario. Um, we are protecting our endpoints from a defender for endpoint perspective with advanced capabilities and automated response. Um, that also entails for the defender for office stack, uh, but also for your SaaS applications, eh? whether it's Microsoft SaaS applications or third party SaaS applications, um, identifying shadow IT, and also able to sanctionize uh, certain actions or activities. And of course, we also able to protect our infrastructure. And that can be an approach where the uh, services are hosted in Azure, uh, on-premise in a hybrid scenario, or even in a multi-cloud scenario where we also have coverage for uh, Google Cloud or Amazon. And the importance of that is that and what I talked about the inventory, your assets might be spread on premise, in the cloud or in a multi-cloud scenario, but you want to have visibility in all these uh, uh, areas of your infrastructure. And based on this, this is an, yeah, uh, an, an translation of how you can use a kind of an 
uh, framework and apply the various components and also as a kind of roadmap eh, start with the foundation in protecting your uh, assets uh, have the foundation in place and from there on you can take the next steps to uh, protect your assets so yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of things you can do uh, right so uh, sentinel is really that uh, what i really like about it and maybe uh, uh, it's just me is that you have so much triggers that coming your way that you can identify and also uh, be on point of what's going on and uh, that's what i really love about about the product we changed the product name right from uh, azure sentinel to microsoft sentinel absolutely so, <laughs> yeah, so all of these uh, these products that were like Azure Defender and Azure um, uh, Defender 4 is now also, uh, all, all now brought to Microsoft Defender and Microsoft Sentinel. And that's because we are now seeing that uh, our security stack is uh, completely uh, around our Microsoft technology uh, and also for our uh, yeah, competitors even like Google and Amazon. So uh, we are able to, to deliver and make you secure in the most uh, uh, yeah, best way. Talking about Sentinel also, uh, there's also a question. Are these queries that we are talking about available for us uh, for, for Sentinel? Uh, that's an amazing question from Eric uh, in the chat. So definitely uh, there are queries available. Uh, you can build your own queries in Sentinel, but you can also leverage the out of the box or pre-built built-in queries. Uh, this hunting query that we're talking about that looks in Azure WAF data to find any possible exploitation attempts against uh, CVE 44228, uh, which involves Log4j vulnerability. So that's available in Sentinel's hunting and advanced hunting capabilities. Yeah. Yeah, one, one thing to mention is that, that the, the several rules are taking benefit of the data sources. So one of the things to utilize those uh, rules, the query rules, analytics rules, is to make sure that you have these data pointers connected. So that's one of the prerequisites uh, being able to use those queries. So if you uh, have uh, Azure Web Application Firewall enabled, make sure that the, the, the uh, analytics capabilities are configured so that the, the signals are flowing into uh, Sentinel, for example, and then you can take fully advantage of these uh, rules and uh, yeah, gain insights of what's going on in your environment. So yeah, that's definitely uh, available. Uh, pre-built in, in Sentinel as well as the, the solution I, I referred to, which you can uh, download from the um, Sentinel uh, Community Hub. And there are even more great solutions over there in the Sentinel Hub. So I will definitely recommend to have a look uh, over there. So um, getting back to the, the, the kill chain and um, the various stages of the kill chain, and also the, the, the solutions we briefly mentioned during the, the session. And with this, we want to emphasize that the various components or solutions we have um, helps you to mitigate uh, the, yeah, the vulnerability and the threat of, for example, uh, the CVE 2021-44228 and remote code execution, for example. So, uh, it all starts with exploitation attempts uh, where agent strings are detected, for example, by Defender for Endpoint or uh, based on the network protection. Uh, we are able to detect those uh, with, with threat experts or with the Microsoft Defender identifiers where the, the malicious code has been downloaded, for example. Um, and lastly, uh, yeah, you see actually it integrates all, all together. So if, if we are perhaps missed at one stage, we, will, we are able to detect and, and mitigate them in an, a second stage. So that's what is also the strength um, of, of our approach, the platform approach, and, and what, what was referenced there. We are already using Defender for Endpoint or we are already using Defender for Cloud. Uh, the strength of those solutions is the solution itself, but also the, the, the tight integration eh, with the intelligent security graph. All these signals are shared uh, in the backend. So if we miss uh, some vulnerability at, at one component, we will uh, detect it in another component and share those signals. So we can also retrospective take actions uh, at the front, for example. So. That's the strength of, of this platform approach and allows you to yeah, stay secure 
and keep up with all these uh, vulnerabilities. So this, this is a great overview of um, how the various solutions are, um, um, yeah, uh, in hooking in into the various stages of, of the kill chain. Amazing, Ronnie. So, um, heading over to you, Shruti, uh, what, what about the key takeaways we can uh, offer to our audience uh, today? Right, absolutely. Let's talk about that. So, firstly, uh, don't think about security as, as something that has to be bolted on on top of your business. Security is supposed to be built in, so there has to be security by design. Uh, it needs to be up to date, of course, so keep upgrading to the latest versions of everything, not just log 4 j uh, Think about your holistic platform approach. Think about different kinds of technology solutions coming together, leveraging sensors, signals, uh, telemetry from each other. Uh, so like Ronnie just mentioned, uh, Sentinel gives you that platform approach. Defender for Cloud gives you that platform approach. M365 Defender, which in itself is a suite of four different kinds of defenders, uh, that gives you that platform approach. That really helps in looking at security end to end for your business. Uh, uh, there is also uh, a concept about having centralized visibility and control. So Think about that. Uh, we do not want your SOC analysts to be wasting time over uh, false positives. We do not want your uh, SOC analysts or any uh, any type of uh, technology security analysts to be uh, wasting time on um, trivial incidents or uh, trivial vulnerabilities. Uh, so think about contextualization uh, of vulnerabilities. Think about um, not just the CVE scores, but also how it impacts your assets that you could be having an asset which is not of much value, uh, but it has a critical vulnerability. In that case, the whole business value of patching that vulnerability um, should be low. You should not spend a lot of money, time, effort, energy in patching those vulnerabilities if you're already planning to decommission certain servers on which the vulnerability is found. So think about that. Think about visibility and control. Uh, with Microsoft, you do get that contextualization. We don't just work on CVE scores. We also take into account your likelihood, your impact, your assets, and so on. Uh, get ahead of the threats with your integrated SIEM and XDR solution approach, which basically uh, XDR is nothing but extended detection and response. Uh, those in the cyber world would already know that. Those who are associated with Microsoft would already know that. Also think about automation. So uh, it's not just it, it doesn't stop here. It's not like we have built a solution. We have built a technology and we are relying on it blindly. Uh, we keep updating our products. We keep uh, thinking about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, user entity behavior analysis. We have a lot of telemetry, a lot of intelligence from different sources. Um, plus, we also provide uh, a space for you to bring in your own threat intelligence if you want to rely on third party threat intel. So in a nutshell, all the Microsoft technology and solutions, they are uh, integratable to a very, very high extent. Um, they are cross-functional, they are cross-platform, and uh, with that, think about improving your security, not just security, not just working hard, but also uh, being efficient and saving time when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. So that's what I would like to summarize the session with. Um, if we go ahead, Ronnie. So the next slide. This is the next slide, Shruti, isn't it? Uh, there's one more. Okay, so we can. I can summarize there. Uh, we also have. Um, I mean, as as next steps, what what you should be thinking about is um, your deep dives. So basically, if you want to understand the capabilities of any of our solutions uh, in depth, then please approach us, contact us with uh, any one to one deep dives. Uh, also, you can join us in different kinds of security workshops. You can uh, request uh, pilots. You can request proof of concepts or trials if required. 
Um, we can uh, talk commercial also at a separate platform if, if required at all, but you can always uh, schedule uh, uh, deep dives or demo sessions with us. Um, eventually, you just need to turn it on. Even with Sentinel, unlike many other uh, seam sore platforms, you don't need a lot of hardware. You don't need external integrations for UEBA, uh, user entity behavior analytics. You don't need a lot of other external automation. It's all built in uh, and not bolted on. So you just need to turn it on. Uh, it's all hosted in Azure. Yeah, and it's important to, to uh, mention as uh, that you can do it also easily in a phased approach. Eh? It's not a big bang or it's a large product. You can start small and, and scale out and, and based on your own pace on, on your own needs. And you can start with, with, with a single workload. But the most important thing is start getting visibility. And that's indeed by just turning it on. Uh, it's, it's getting visibility if you don't already have. So that's all where it starts. Yep, uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your participation, also your questions, uh, and handing it over to Yeroon uh, to wrap it up. And you can reach us anytime on our LinkedIn IDs. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much all for listening and uh, amazing session with a lot of attendees. And uh, if you think that your colleague or co-worker is also interested in this, there will be a recording. We're also going to put this on our new uh, YouTube channel around security. Uh, so uh, watch out for that. Uh, you get some information also on that. And also where you can find this as a podcast in uh, the near future. So uh, we're almost finished everything setting everything up. So uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you guys soon again. And uh, if you have any questions, just do reach out to us you can find us uh, on linkedin or via our email addresses that will be provided with the slide deck that will be provided to you so thank you so much have a great day and uh, speak to you guys soon bye bye thanks for listening to our podcast we are microsoft the netherlands